and welcome everyone to the summer seminar series. Uh, my name is Ravi Palanivelu. I'm a faculty in the School of Plant Sciences at the University of Arizona. Um, I am, my lab works on plant reproduction and we are also moving into heat stress in plant reproduction. And uh, so I'm, I was very happy when Rod asked me to do the honors today. So first I would like to introduce uh, Rod Wing and then we'll go to Scott Seleska. Um, so uh, Rod uh, Wing, uh, you know, started his career. Um, uh, he did his BA in biochemistry at the University of California, Berkeley, and then did his PhD in genetics. He got his PhD in genetics at the University of California, Davis in 1987. And uh, then he, was the USDA ARS Terry Kinney postdoctoral fellow at the Plant Gene Expression Center at UC Berkeley under the guidance of Dr. Sheila McCormick. Um, since then, uh, Rod has been a faculty at Texas A&M, Clemson University, and then he came to University of Arizona in 2005. Um, in Clemson University, he was the founding director of Genomics Institute. He also started Arizona Genomics Institute and is the director of it at the University of Arizona. He's also a professor um, at the Bio5 Institute at the University of Arizona, Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Arizona. And uh, but currently is the director, Center for Desert Agriculture um, at King Abdullah University of Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia. Um, uh, long, I mean, Rod has a long list of honors and awards is uh, too long for me to list, which is a great accomplishment. But I just want to mention a couple of them. In 2010, he was elected as the Fellow of American Association for the Advancement of Science. And in 2019, uh, he won the, he became the Regents Professor at the University of Arizona. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Rod Wing and I'll turn it over to you, Rod. could see your slides. Rod, I think you might be muted. There you go. I'm good, I'm good. Sorry. Okay, everybody can hear me now? Yes. I'm okay, busy. good. Um, thanks a lot, Robbie, for the uh, introduction. I appreciate that. It's uh, We've known each other a long time. And uh, today I'm going to um, uh, uh, Kind of give give a, a little different uh, seminar, um, and uh, the reason why is because I, I originally wanted to start this whole program out with uh, Scott and me, but our schedules uh, did not work out very well. So uh, I, I what I wanted to do was start out with an introduction to KAUST and the the Center for Desert Ag, and then I'm going to touch on some of the uh, themes that I've been working on um, in my career and and things that I've been working on here. Because I just really, uh, again, this this whole idea is to really um, consider the idea of uh, trying to develop a joint center for desert agriculture between the um, um, the, you know, the two universities. And there's uh, so much that we can learn from each other, and we are in similar environments. And um, uh, uh, from microbiomes to climate change to uh, and everything in the middle. So, um, so. You'll hear a little bit about cows and then some of the things I've been working on. So let me see if I can get this thing to work. All right. Um, so I, I joined, uh, I uh, uh, left, uh, joined Kaust, uh, in, in uh, 2019 um, uh, on a leave of absence from the University of Arizona. And um, I came here for several reasons, but um, uh, today I'll talk, talk about um, some of the work that uh, we're doing in the Center for Desert Ag. So KAUST, is, this is the, the beacon. Uh, 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 we're, we're near Jeddah uh, on the Red Sea. And uh, it's, uh, KAUST was, uh, is a, essentially a beacon of knowledge that bridges 
people and cultures for the betterment of humanity. That's their goal. And um, the university was, was essentially uh, established um, as a model um, with uh, Caltech in mind. Uh, it's 11 years old, they have 186 faculty. It's a graduate school only. I think they're planning to get up to about 220. Um, there's three divisions, 10 research centers. And um, the center that uh, I'm associated with is called the Center for Desert Agriculture, and it's in the uh, Biological and Environmental Science and Engineering Division. Um, we've uh, developed a strategic plan and an implementation plan. And essentially the bottom line of, of all of this is finding ways to feed the world without destroying the planet. Uh, and this is essentially through developing tools and studying um, uh, um, concept in sustainable agriculture. Uh, again, from, from microbiomes to uh, um, uh, ecology. So this is the, our team. Uh, we have 10, ten faculty, uh, uh, three new faculty mem members, uh, Monica, uh, Brenda, and uh, Jesse Poland's going to join us in uh, uh, next month. Um, it's an outstanding group of scientists to work with, and um, essentially, uh, if you if you um, want to kind of want a vision of the type of lab space that we have, this would be uh, essentially like one floor of uh, the Keating Bio Research Building with uh, the, the two labs and all the uh, office spaces and, and desk spaces uh, in the middle. That's that's pretty equivalent of what what. Uh, uh, our, the center is, and plus there's a greenhouse space and field space. So there's um, five uh, kind of general areas for, for the center. Um, one is essentially the, you know, the, the most, uh, where most of the focus is on, on basic research, uh, wet lab, field, and computational uh, biology across the, you know, individual research projects and collaborative research projects. There's also um, uh, as, a, as a team, we're working on uh, three research projects together, Fast Fit Palms, which is led by Ikram, and uh, Neo Domestication by Simon, and the Native Genome Project by myself. Uh, we're, we're also uh, kind of pushing this idea of a paradigm shift for sustainable agriculture in, in the country, and um, I'll tell you why, about, uh, why in a few minutes. Um, there's an education outreach program and entrepreneurial spinoffs. So today I'm going to... Uh, um, talk more about the, what the center is up to, and then I'll talk about uh, my research in, in, uh, later on in the talk. So, and Robbie, make sure that I uh, um, uh, don't go over because I have uh, about 120 slides. So uh, I'm going to do that in, in, in 30 minutes. I don't really have 120 slides. <laughs> okay. So um, uh, the first project is called Fast Fit Palms, and this is led by Ikram. And uh, the uh, dates are a uh, uh, culturally and economically significant commodity, uh, both locally and regionally. And uh, a goal of this project is to gain basic understanding of the genome biology, physiology, and development of date palms, and to uh, be able to use that information to breed new varieties that are, are more sustainable. Uh, date palms drink about 170 liters of water a day. And, uh, uh, there's not a whole lot of water in this country, so uh, uh, we need to try to work to make this a more uh, sustainable uh, crop. And uh, it's really fascinating all all the date palm varieties that that are that are grown in this country, about 400 um, uh, around the around the nation. Um, some of the current research priorities for for date palm are uh, germination and root development biology, uh, development of a robust transformation system to do gene editing. Um, development of, of uh, ultra high quality reference genomes from uh, 10 to 15 of the most popular varieties, and then population genetics of these, these 400 varieties that grow around the country. Um, one of the things that we're uh, pursuing right now is the, the idea of developing, trying to develop a, a common garden of these 400 varieties around the, around the nation and, and maybe elsewhere, possibly even Arizona. And, uh, we're working with a, a, a group called the Ministry of the Environment, Water, and Agriculture, MIWA. Uh, they have a, a wonderful uh, oasis in, in the province of uh, Alasa. Uh, this is where Kaust is in the province of, uh, of Mecca, right here. And we're working to develop a, 
a common garden here, and then trying to get one somewhere else in, in, the, in the country to, to so, so that we can um, measure phenotypes um, in multiple environments and then use that information, combine that information with the, the genome biology of, of these species, of these varieties. Uh, the second project that's being worked on by the team is uh, called Neo Domestication, sort of by Simon. And uh, uh, neo domestication uh, could be defined as the conversion of crop wild relatives or other potentially economically important plants into sustainable commodities. And so essentially, this is um, uh, the idea behind this is to uh, take a plant uh, that already knows how to grow in an extreme environment and domesticate it. Um, and we'll, and, and uh, rather than, it's pretty hard to teach a rice plant to grow in, in, a, in salt water, but you can take a, a, a wild relative of rice that can grow in salt water and teach it how to produce more food because we already know so much about the, the, um, uh, the genes involved in, in domesticating the species. So um, this was recently um, demonstrated uh, in, in, in the wild relatives of rice uh, in a collaboration I have with Chion Li in, in uh, in China for um, a wild species called um, uh, Ariza alta. And uh, the, um, the way that this was, was established uh, very methodically was to establish a, a, a transformation system in uh, the wild tetrapoid uh, rice, uh, generate a high quality reference genome, identify uh, homo homologs of agriculturally important genes from diploid rice and then uh, um, target these using gene editing. So this was a, um, a, a landmark a piece of work uh, in, in, in tetraploid rice and now we want to try to do this in um, uh, other, other, other crops. So um, the three species that we're working on right now are uh, Phonio millet. Uh, this is being led by, uh, by Simon Kratzinger. Uh, this is a, a, a cereal crop that has been has been um, partially domesticated in Africa, but it still has a long way to go. And, and Simon is working on trying to uh, improve the uh, uh, this crop, uh, its, its yield, its seed size, and its disease resistance. This is this is corn, and this is uh, conium melon. Um, Mark uh, Mark Tester is leading an effort in Salicornia. Salicornia is a, is, a, is a plant that can, it's a halophyte. It can actually grow in full salt water. And uh, this, is, this is a paper that actually uh, introduced uh, Salicornia to the world uh, out of the University of Arizona back in uh, 1991. Um, the promise of Salicornia as a, as a new uh, like biofuel or an oil crop. Um, and the kind of the real concept here is, is irrigating crops with seawater. So what can we, you know, can we actually grow salicornia in seawater, sea and uh, can we uh, use some of the, this, what we learn from this, to improve other crops in, in, in this way? Because there's plenty of salt water in this country, but there's very uh, uh, little fresh water. The last one is um, a rice of cortada. I'm leading this. This is a wild relative of rice uh, uh, that that can actually uh, grow in in, uh, in brackish water. And it can also survive full seawater. Uh, we have this uh, growing in the greenhouse, uh, both in um, in Arizona and in, at, at Kaust. Um, it has a range from Myanmar to Pakistan. And um, uh, uh, we've already generated a high quality genome. We're working on uh, develop, uh, collecting voucher specimens uh, throughout uh, Bangladesh right now to uh, develop a transformation system. Um, we're studying the functional genomics of salt tolerance, and, and the hope is to be able to you neo know, domesticate this within uh, like three to four years. Um, the last project is a, a native genome project, and uh, this is something that kind of reminded me of, of Scott a little bit. This is when I when he first heard me uh, give a, a lecture. I, I said I started out as a biochemist, and I want to end up as an ecologist, and I'm starting to head that direction right now, and. Um, the goal I thought you said you wanted to end up as an evolutionary biologist. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm, 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 still, I'm still learning how to become an evolutionary biologist, but I may end up as an okay. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. <laughs> I'm still, the evolutionary biology part, I'm, I'm, I'm stuck there right now. So, but uh, 
Uh, the goal of the, in this project is to try to sequence all uh, aquatic and terrestrial life forms in the, in the kingdom by 2030 for uh, conservation and biodiversity, environmental monitoring, protection, and evolutionary analysis. And these are three of the species we've already been working on, the Ajwa date palm from Medina, Asawi rice from uh, Alasa, and then uh, the Gur falcon. Uh, falconry is a, is a huge uh, 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 cultural sport uh, in, in, this, in this country. Um, so we recently uh, uh, took our first trip. We have a collaboration with Miwa again on, on, on doing this. This is um, our, our first um, adventure into the, into the country. This is, this is uh, in an area called Taif. This is a, a juniper forest at about 6,000 feet. And one of the problems, this is our voucher uh, juniper plant right here. One of the big problems they have in this country is uh, uh, a phenomenon called uh, dieback, where the plants can will grow but then they die back and it's really not known what, what this is, how this is caused. Um, this is a Moringa plant. This is our, our guide, Ollie. We actually did find a little bit of water and this is uh, Zisophus uh, Christa spina. Um, this is uh, the crown of Christ. And uh, here's Nahe Muhammad, uh, Muhammad, a postdoc in the group who's explaining the project to our, our colleagues at, at breakfast on the, on the desert floor in, in uh, Laith, Alith. These are some of the species we're going after right now and have collected, and we're uh, going on another collection trip uh, uh, on Sunday for about uh, nine more species. Okay, um, I'm already running out of time. So the, uh, uh, the next, the next um, um, focus is on um, um, trying to drive a paradigm shift in, in the country uh, towards sustainable ag. And it turns out that uh, what I've, I've said on a broken record, but it's hotter than hell and there's no water in this country. So how do you sustainably grow food in this country? So we're thinking of uh, really promoting um, um, uh, controlled environmental ag on a very large scale where uh, we produce uh, high value crops in major urban centers and greenhouses and then uh, distribute that uh, around the country. So this is, this is uh, to promote a, a large collabor collaborative effort with the um, with the Controlled Environmental Ag Center at, at Arizona. Uh, and so we're uh, uh, pushing this idea. So this is just a photograph of, of what we could envision in the country in terms of uh, sustainability of, of saving water and, uh, and producing high value crops. Most of the food that's um, produced in, in Saudi is actually flown in. Um, I'm getting uh, 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 strawberries from Ecuador and rice from California. So uh, uh, anyway, um, one of the final things I wanted to talk about was um, uh, promoting, uh, uh, working with, with uh, uh, Saudi youth to uh, uh, promote sustainable agriculture. And there's a program in, in Berkeley, California called the Edible Schoolyard, where um, uh, people, where the, where the students actually are growing their own food, producing a locally produced lunch, and um, the, the goal, this is led by a woman named Alice Waters who runs a restaurant called Chez Panisse in, in Berkeley. Um, and their, their goal is to provide a free sustainable uh, lunch for all K through 12 students in, in, in California, about 30 million people. So um, we're trying to develop this, this concept in, in, in Kaust, in, in the Kaust School, which is a school in the local school in the, in the Kaus community and through wall, which is right next door. So good food should be a right and not a privilege. All right. And lastly, uh, the CDA is also involved in entre entrepreneurial spinoffs. And uh, these are some of the spinoff companies that have come out of the CDA and uh, some that are in the ag space. And I, I'd like to highlight here the Red Sea Farms, which is uh, led by Mark Tester, who we've already uh, at her give a seminar, and uh, <clears throat> I won't I won't uh, describe that as he already talked about that. Okay, so uh, I, how many minutes do I have left? Ten. Fifteen. You have fifteen. 15 oh, okay. Minutes. All right. All right. Good. Thank you. Uh, so um, this is uh, these are some themes uh, out of my group. Uh, it's called the Wing Lab Cows in Arizona. Uh, you know, I still have a, a joint appointment in Arizona. 
And uh, so I'm, I'm kind of um, working in, in, in both spheres right now. Um, and our, our kind of our, our theme would be using genome biology and evolution to drive sustainable agriculture and protect the environment. So um, uh, the International Alignment, uh, Horizon Map Alignment Project, I'll talk a bit about that. Uh, creation of digital gene banks. We already talked about neo-domestication and uh, the Native Genome Project. So one of the, the, the main uh, problems that, that um, we work on in, in, in plant biology and agriculture is really how do we solve the 10 billion people question? Um, and uh, that is uh, essentially is how do we grow enough food to feed the world by 2050? And rice will play a critical role in that, in that in trying to solve that problem as it, as it already feeds about half the world. And uh, we're trying to develop new rice varieties that are, are much higher yielding, but have less of an environmental footprint. And in, in China and in Southeast Asia, uh, varieties like this would be called like green super rice. So you can find uh, diversity in rice for almost any conceivable trait. And this is what we're, this is how we're attacking this problem by understanding natural variation. So here we see Panicle, uh, seed color, seed shape, seed size, uh, panicle architecture, and uh, plant architecture. So these are just some of the phenotypes that, that you can visually see. There's, there's thousands and thousands of, of, uh, of different phenotypes and natural variation, uh, hundreds of thousands that, that, that can be tapped into, that, that have yet to be tapped into yet. So, um, we work, uh, uh, how are we uh, capturing this natural variation? Uh, we're working on the genus Ariza, which um, has, the, has uh, two cultivated species, Ariza sativa and Ariza papyrima. Uh, the genus has wide distribution in habitat uh, in uh, uh, Southeast Asia, Australia, Africa, and uh, Central and South America. Um, we have, uh, 11 distinct genome types. The AA genomes are the primary genome pool, gene pool for cultivated rice, <clears throat> along with uh, these remaining genome types. And these, these have been um, defined cytogenetically. There's also um, several polyploid species. And there's also a 3.6 genome size variation just within the genus. This uh, represents about 15 million years of evolutionary history. So um, what we'd like to say is the, uh, the wild, the wild uh, Relatives of rice are agronomically inferior, but contain a virtually untapped reservoir of genes that can be used for crop improvement. Here's cultivated Asian rice, cultivated African rice, and you can see the uh, tremendous uh, phenotypic diversity uh, throughout the genus. So um, I've, all, I've, I've been working with the International Rice Research Institute for many years. I had a, a joint appointment there as an AXA chair for five years. and. Um, the International Rice Research Institute, ERI, has uh, 130,000 accessions of rice that have been collected from around the world. Um, in 2018, we uh, published a manuscript um, describing the, the resequencing of 3,000 of these accessions and uh, uh, trying to understand the, the SNP diversity across these accessions. And one, one of the main um, uh, results that came out of this work was the the ability to um, divide these uh, 3,000 accessions into 15 subpopulations. Here's the uh, uh, kind of the Japonica type, or the Indica type, and then the Ausch type, which are three kind of main categories. And then you can subdivide those into, a, into an additional, uh, you know, like uh, uh, 15 subpops. So um, what we're what we're trying to do now with that that information is to develop what we call a digital gene bank uh, for uh, cultivated rice. And the idea here is to generate uh, ultra high quality reference genomes uh, for, uh, that represent uh, these 15 subpopulations, resequence 10,000 rice accessions uh, to 20 to 40 x coverage, detect all SNP and structural variation. Uh, with this data set and then resequence the remaining collection of 110,000 at low coverage and impute the structural variation across all of ERI's uh, gene bank to create a, a digital gene bank for cultivated rice. And simultaneously, uh, these 3,000 to 10,000 accessions would be phenotyped um, uh, through what was called a global rice array. 
and that would where we would uh, plant these 3,000 to 10,000 accessions um, across the globe. And this is this is where uh, this is the original uh, uh, planting at the in, in, uh, Los Banos, the Philippines. And I, I have this dream of uh, doing something like this in Maricopa. And uh, I don't know if we'll ever be able to do it, but I want to do it. And we want to do something similar to this in in, in, in uh, Saudi as well as uh, or uh, you know uh, in uh, Africa and, and uh, uh, India as well. So um, to the beginning of this uh, concept of, of uh, generating platinum standard reference sequences, um, we we have already done this and we have funding to uh, sequence these 10,000 rice accessions right now. But I'll talk a little about, a bit about the platinum standard reference sequences. So one of the one of the key elements to understanding and capturing and exploiting natural variation is having access to ultra high quality reference genomes that are contiguous and gap free and superior across all regions and not just gene space or what I like to call gas assemblies. So we call these platinum standard genomes. So uh, over the past couple of years, we set out to um, um, generate these uh, platinum standard reference genomes for the 15 um, um, accessions. And we, have, we finished that about a year ago. Um, and this is just the uh, uh, data for 12 of these assemblies. What? Oh, okay. Um, this is number of contigs and number of gaps. So we're, we have many of, many of these um, species now that have four to five gaps. Uh, the worst one here is IR64, and we've, we've actually improved that recently. So um, this, this data was released uh, uh, around Christmas in 2020 and uh, in 2019 and uh, just published in, in uh, uh, scientific uh, data uh, in April of, the, of uh, last year. Um, so this is, this is um, another representing it, representation of these 15 accessions. Uh, these were all done in collaboration with Arizona and KAUST, except for some of the original ones, the original uh, genome was Nipambari in 2005, and then at Arizona we did uh, Ming Wei 63, and Chen Chen 97, a few others, and then I'd just like to say that we just uh, got got this paper accepted in molecular plant, where these two genomes have now been completely closed. So they're um, the first uh, two gap-free uh, genomes of, of any crop plant uh, that have been released. So that's pretty exciting, uh, all the way through the central region. Okay. So um, now we're on to uh, sequencing these 10,000 accessions, and um, uh, that's being done uh, as a uh, collaboration between Erie, uh, Arizona, Calist, Arizona, and uh, Hudson Alpha uh, in Alabama. Um, one thing I'd like to mention is that Young Zhao, a postdoc in my lab, and, and Naga, um, who's a computer scientist at Calist, has a, established a, a GATK pipeline using the Shaheen supercomputer. And uh, now we can uh, call SNPs um, from the 3000 accessions in um, uh, five days, whereas it used to take about a half a year. So this is the, 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 the machine here and that's doing all this and it's very exciting. So we're actually really moving, moving fast now, um, getting mapping all this data uh, all the resequencing data and calling SNPs um, on, on, on reference genomes. So we're not limited just to these 16, we can even go beyond that. Um, with respect to the wild relatives of rice, um, uh, we, we've, we've generated high quality reference genomes for pretty much all the diploids. We're now focusing on the polyploids. Um, uh, a grant that I have pending right now is called the ARISA in the Americas, and we're um, We've, we've generated uh, CCDD uh, reference genomes for these three species here, and we're hoping that we can go into uh, these countries and collect samples for doing population genetics to understand its population biology and, and, and develop candidates for, for neo domestication as well. So that's a, that's a future project. Okay, um, I'd just like to uh, end by uh, um, thanking. Uh, uh, the, the, you know, lots and lots of collaborators over the years. These are our IOMAP collaborators um, for
former Arizona um, uh, collaborate uh, uh, staff and uh, at, at Arizona right now, we still have uh, this team right here. And I just like to mention that uh, Dario Capetti just joined the Arizona Genomics Institute um, as the associate director. So he, we're very happy to have him back and uh, thanks Dario for coming back. And um, so it's uh, definitely a, a stable organization again now. And then this is my team in, in Arizona, I mean, in, in, at, at Kaust. And uh, I also want, really want to thank the, uh, the uh, Center for Desert Ag. Uh, it's a wonderful team of scientists to work with. And we all hope to be uh, working with you guys in, in Arizona over the next, uh, over the coming uh, decade. And uh, I'll just say thanks. And this is how I see the world. And I want everybody to see the world like this. So uh, thank you very much. Hope I did okay. Did I do okay with the 60 slides? Yes, Rob. You were you were well under time. You had four minutes. <laughs> okay. So we'll, so we'll move into we'll Scott. Roll over. We'll roll over your minutes to Scott. <laughs> okay. So thank you, Rod. So we'll, as in the past, we'll save the questions for Rod uh, till the end, so that you can ask your questions to both the speakers today. Uh, so now I'll. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce. Our next speaker, Scott Seleska. So, <clears throat> so Scott got his BS in physics um, and minor in electrical engineering from MIT in 1986. And then he got his PhD in energy and resources at the University of California, Berkeley. And his advisor was um, John Hart. And then uh, he did his postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard University in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences, and his advisor was Stephen Bobsey. Um, and then um, Scott um, joined the University of Arizona, and uh, currently he, he rose through the ranks. Uh, currently, he's a full professor at the University of Arizona Ecology and Evolutionary Biology Department. He's also the director of science, UA Biosphere 2, the Landscape Evolution Observatory, LEO. Um, Scott has won many honors. Um, most notable is she was elected as the fellow of the Ecological Society of America in 2019. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Scott, and thanks for talking today. We can see your title slide. Oh, great. Okay, well, uh, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, and good morning, everyone in Arizona. Good evening, everyone in uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, so, uh, and, and thank you to Rob for um, uh, inviting me to this great uh, series of talks. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Um, so I'm going to pick up after Rod's excellent talk uh, about agricultural um, applications and agroecosystems. And I'm not gonna talk so much, or actually not gonna talk at all about agriculture or agroecosystems per se, but about technologies and approaches that are, that are, and I think will enable us to tackle an exciting and fundamental grand challenge of biology and of earth system science, including with application to agroecosystems. So I hope the connection will be eventually clear. But this challenge is how do we scale from molecules to ecosystems? Uh, so that's what's illustrated uh, here in my title. Um, and in order to do that, we need to use some key enabling technologies and approaches, uh, and we need to bring them together, integrate them in a way they haven't been integrated before. And so I, at that point, I want to, you know, it, I, Isaac Newton, the famous, you know, obviously the, the founder of, of modern physics and somewhat uh, classical physics, once said, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. So well, if Newton can acknowledge his giants, being one of the great giants of the history of science himself, then so of course, can we, and I will in a few no, uh, slides acknowledge what I mean here by the giants of Joseph von Fraunhofer and Karl Lowe's. Uh, the photos here of the two example systems I'm going to talk about today uh, on the left is a thawing permafrost mire in Arctic Sweden. Uh, and number two on the right is an amazing and unique tool we have for advancing science, uh, the University of Air, advancing ecosystem science and advancing in particular this challenge of scaling 
um, University of Arizona's uh, Biosphere 2 uh, in Tucson, Arizona. So let's start off by asking, uh, what does it mean, first of all, to scale from molecules to ecosystems? So this diagram, which I've adapted from my colleague, Virginia Rich uh, at Ohio State University, who's a longtime uh, collaborator and fellow traveler in this challenge. Um, she complements my ecosystem science, which is my core background with the molecular uh, ecology of microbes. Um, and so what this diagram depicts is uh, basically an adaption of what is uh, in, in her trade called the central dogma of biology, which is that information transfer um, is from the DNA, which encodes metabolic functions of the cell uh, to transcription of RNA uh, for the functions needed at a given moment, which then is further translated into the proteins, which catalyze the reactions that, that are needed to be done. And we can, th we can think about this as, in addition to this information transfer as, as what we mean in some sense by scaling, is especially if we propagate it further uh, from the individual cell. Um, to populations of cells, uh, which are, include different kinds of cells and different kinds of organisms, uh, to whole communities. So this core process then extends from the genes within individual cells through to the ecosystem level. Uh, cells interact with other cells and populations and communities. Uh, and of course, the distinction there is a little bit fuzzier for, for microbes than for macrobes, but this propagates on up to ecosystems. Uh, the cells in these systems have varying levels of genetic connectivity for lateral information transfer, but we're interested in extending that all the way up to the system outputs, things like greenhouse gases, uh, and um, of course, how the environment structures those interactions all the way from the DNA level up to the ecosystem outputs. And then in particular, today, in the, facing the challenge of global climate change, we are interested in how changing environments can propagate through the system to produce changing outputs, including things like greenhouse gases, which of course are at the ecosystem level, a, a, another challenge that we're, you know, a key, a key fundamental challenge of, of modern science is the global change challenge. So, but in any case, I'm gonna just uh, discuss how advancing research uh, on this challenge of scaling from molecules to ecosystems has four distinct challenges that we, that we want to face. So here's three of them. Uh, the first is acquiring and understanding molecular and metaomic data at that sort of baseline small scale. Acquiring ecosystem biogeochemical data that can be, here's the critical part, linked uh, to the molecular scale data. And number three, finally, testing and uh, this our theories or models for how these two things can be, the first two things can be integrated in whole experimental ecosystems. And finally, I'm going to add a fourth sort of meta challenge to this, to, this, to this list of things we need to do. The fourth challenge is a training challenge. Uh, how do we, because actually we don't do this very well in our current science. Uh, and so uh, we'd like to train a new generation of scientists in both ecosystem and genomic sciences as if they were an integrated uh, whole. And so, so we don't, our current generation doesn't do that very well. So the idea is that the, the only way we're eventually going to succeed here is, is in a looking to the future and training a new generation. Okay, so let's, um, let me talk about uh, these first three challenges. First, first challenges one and two, understanding and acquiring molecular metaomic data and linking that to ecosystem biogeochemical data. I'm gonna give an example of trying to meet this challenge in a particular system, looking at methane and carbon cycle responses to permafrost thaw in a field site. Uh, this is our isogeny project. Isogeny stands for isotopes and geno uh, genomes. Uh, and the site is a site of thawing permafrost in Arctic Sweden. And the study is basically trying to integrate ecosystem scale fluxes of carbon gases like methane and their isotopes with microbial metagenomics. And then challenge three, of course, will be focusing on how we bring that kind of approach to uh, and test it further more precisely in a unique controlled experiment uh, at Biosphere 2. Okay, so here's this, this isogeny project, the isotopes and, and genomes for understanding ecosystems. Uh, three is just the third iteration of this uh, grant process. It's an interdisciplinary international team that encompasses biogeochemistry, microbial ecology, and modeling. And here's uh, you know, the sort of lead PIs. There's, of course, the whole army of people 
sort of really doing the work uh, under the supervision of these folks. And this was all been funded so far by the Department of Energy um, Genomic Science. Okay, so um, of course, we must acknowledge also the site itself. Uh, Stardalen Meyer in northern Sweden near the Abisko uh, Field Station and the Abisko National uh, Park there. Uh, so here we see a picture of it, including so you can see some of the boardwalks that allow people to walk out there and a field state shack that is housing instrumentations um, and some of the interconnected lakes uh, that surround the mire. Uh, we're going to focus on this. This is representing a thawing chrono, sequ a chrono sequence of thaw from dry permafrost pulses depicted here on the left to intermediate thaw stage, which happens when the uh, uh, permafrost starts thawing. We have these sort of the, the structure that is partly uh, the ice in the permafrost melts um, and the ecosystem starts collapsing and becomes partially inundated. Uh, and then finally, when there's fully and complete thaw, we, we have uh, basically the system becomes um, an inundated area that has got fully hydrologically connected to the rest of the mire. Uh, and that's, and along with this transition, we have changes in hydrology, changes in the community composition of plants, uh, changes in the geochemistry in particular the pH. Uh, so there's lots of things changing, which we're representing, all represented by this gradient of a permafrost thaw. And I'm gonna show you some results as we move along this thaw. Focusing on this challenge of, of scaling. And so here's a, a depiction of so just sort of basically a first order test, which is, can we detect in some meaningful metrics, correlations across space, or, or, or in, which in this case is a surrogate for time for thaw, changes in molecular data that correlate with or correspond to changes in biogeochemical data. And we're gonna focus of course in this case on methane uh, as an important connection to the greenhouse gas climate change problem. So in order to do the molecular data side, of course, we need to be able to sequence lots of DNA from, from whole ecosystems. And of course, uh, here, here's just a depiction of how that has become so much more feasible in the last few decades. You guys, uh, Rod, Rod spoke a little bit about this in terms of the, uh, the more recent advances that go more recently than the end of this, this slide, which just shows the, uh, as an index, the cost of sequencing a human-sized genome over the last few uh, decades. And you can see, of course, everybody knows here that it's a big, big increase. Our project in Sweden, by the way, started in around 2010 uh, and it's continuing today. So you can see that the, in fact, we benefited from this very practically because our first budget for sequencing was very much higher than it actually turned out to need to be. So we were actually able to uh, divert that to, to accomplish more things than we thought we could um, just because the sequencing costs in the, in the time period of the five years of the grant went down uh, a lot. Um, so anyway, this, this has enabled uh, an increase in science. Um, the other challenge here, uh, uh, once you get away from the molecular scale is the ecosystem scale challenge. And so here's, here's, a, here's, a, here's a particular technology I just wanna mention that we've used, which is not, not only the flux, we're of course measuring the fluxes of methane in this system as, as permafrost thaws, we get more methane, uh, but the isotopic composition of that used to be a really challenging technical problem. You used to have to collect individual samples in the field, take them back to the lab, process them through a rather labor intensive process. But now we get all this, automatically uh, in the field. Uh, and that's a, that's a new step that wasn't really available uh, 10 years or 15 years ago. Uh, and this is enabled by this uh, laser spectrometer, uh, basically, which is using laser light to detect the absorption bands in the different isotopes of methane. Uh, and that is connected to automatic chambers. Uh, and we get, uh, and here's just a representation of those three ecosystems across the gradient of thaw from intact pulsa in the lower left the thawing bog in the middle uh, image to the fully thawed fen in the right. And if we sort of look at the data that's coming from this in terms of the methane fluxes that are recorded automatically every few hours for the entire growing season, we can put together a nice graph like this, uh, which shows um, in brown, again, is the fully, the intact permafrost system, uh, which is basically showing zero flux of methane. The green is the partially thawed uh, bog, and the blue is the fully thawed fen. As you, and as you can see, the, 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 the first expectation, which is that permafrost thaw, which releases organic matter that has been locked away, frozen in permafrost to microbial attack, 
leads to big increases in methane production, which of course is a positive feedback to climate change as, as permafrost thaw, and, and that's, that's a challenge there. Uh, what we'd like to do here is look into the microbial mechanisms that underlie this and um, understand better. And so what we have at the ecosystem scale now is the, for each point on here, which is a, 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 a measurement of, of methane flux across the replicates in each ecosystem, um, a methane isotopic composition, which is important and helpful here because it's an indication of the metabolic pathway of methane production. So let me just show you what the difference if we take each point here that's a flux of methane and turn it into its isotopic composition, uh, which we're simultaneously also measuring and looking at in particular at the green and the blue points, uh, blue time series, uh, and in, in look at the distribution over the course of the growing season, here's, a, here's a, a depiction of what we're finding. And we can see that those distributions of the methane isotopic composition is, are quite distinct at the different stages of thaw. The preliminary stages of thaw on the left in green, we have an isotopic composition of close to minus 80, uh, which is basically more isotopic discrimination in the methane by the methane producers in that system than in the blue system on the right, which has a minus 65, which is less isotopic discrimination by the methane producers in there. This, this isotopic discrimination is done by the microbes that are producing the methane. And there's two basic broad categories of methane production methane metabolism, acetate fermentation, which discriminates less, and CO2 reduction, which discriminates more. And so this should tell us in principle, something about the microbial communities that are doing the methane production. So let's just take, look, look, at, the, uh, look at this in, a, in another way that might be considered, I'm trying to analogize it here to a time series. So we've been measuring this over a number of years now, it's, now it's a decade, but here we show the first six years in each habitat and we sort of connect each of the habitats as thinking about the habitats representing the long, longer time scale of, of thaw and the within the habitats what's happening with, over time in each habitat and string them all together and get an impression of what we imagine the long-term trajectory is. First here of methane fluxes, so thaw increases methane emissions going from the intact pulsa to the thawing bog to the fully thawed fen. Uh, it changes uh, methane isotopic composition towards heavier isotopes. So we see going from that green, which is more negative and therefore lighter to the yellowish band, which is uh, less negative and therefore heavier and therefore more acetoclastic. And the question is, do these correspond, do these differences in isotopic composition correspond to differences in micro microbial communities of the methane community, methane producing community? So here, here we see the archaeal community. The pie chart is representing just the archaeal, uh, the archaeal microbes, um, and it's divided by color by function. The green is hydronotrophic or CO2 reductive methanogens. The purple or blue are acetoclastic uh, methanogens, and the gray are, are other archaea. And we see as we move across here, we, we, we move from a community that is dominated by green, that is hydronotroph or uh, to one that is less dominated by green, but more by purple and blue, which is um, acetoclast. So this basically uh, is showing that we do in fact have this first order test of uh, being satisfied. We have a, this is what I call here, key previous result number one, basically concordant response of the isotope geochemistry and the microbial communities. As the isotope composition shifts, the microbial communities shift as well in the same direction, or rather I should say, as the microbial community shift, and therefore the isotopic discrimination changes because their metabolism is different, we get the emergence result at the ecosystem scale, which is the shift in the isotopic composition. So this was a very cool result. It, you know, it seems very simple now, but it, in 2014, it was a nature paper um, by my postdoc, Harry McCallie, it's pictured there. Um, and we might wanna ask them, well, who are these guys actually that are doing this? And so of course we're, we're doing the detailed molecular microbial ecology. And it turns out that the green area there in the, um, in the bog, in the thawing bog is almost a, an entirely one organism, an abundant hydronotroph that actually hadn't been identified before, but it was a uh, companion paper described uh, its initial gene, the genome uh, indicated there on the left in the circle. And we named it Methanoflorens stordalomarensis. Uh, because it was found in Stordal and Meyer, but it turns out to be uh, ubiquitous across the globe uh, once we knew what to look for. Well, anyway, if we look at this very abundant uh, single uh, genus, um, 
it turned out that that was actually a pretty good predictor of the isotopic fractionation of the methane coming out at the ecosystem scale. So this was, this was sort of the key correlation result. The, the blue is the uh, fully thawed uh, system. The sphagnum in green is the partially thawed system. And you can see that in any case across this gradient, the variation in the, the abundance of this critter as measured by the 16S microbial uh, marker gene, re, re, RNA, ribosomal RNA marker gene relative abundance really predicted well the effective fractionation of the methane that was in the pore water. And this turned out to be the single best predictor, actually, the relative abundance of, of this critter. Uh, uh, even more important in, in this relative importance analysis of other predictors that geochemists would have normally used, things like the water table depth or the peat uh, C13 content, or the, uh, which was the substrate for methane production, or the C to N ratio. Those things were important and they improved the model, but it still turned out that the relative abundance the, uh, of this particular organism uh, Methanosaurin stordala morensis, which has now become one of my favorite microbes, uh, is the, the, a, an important predictor of the ecosystem scale processes that we're seeing by the methane isotopes. Okay, so this is you know, a key previous result too then, that uh, Methanosaurin stordala morensis, the most abundant archaeon in the system, matters a lot for isotope ecosystem geochemistry. It's the best predictor of methane isotopic fractionation. And this sort of as a, at the larger scale helped us, or, or in the larger conceptual picture, helped us connect gene scale information, which we got from the relative abundance of that guy, to ecosystem process, which we got from the isotopes. And this highlighted the importance of microbial ecology for ecosystem process, because there was this ecological thing, the relative abundance of a, of a, of a particular critter in the community that, that mattered. And so at this point, I want to step back and acknowledge the the giants on whose shoulders we are, we are standing and which were enabling this. Uh, so here on the left is Joseph Ron Hanhofer, um, who was the discoverer of spectral absorption lines, which are um, then used, which, which are the things that happen to light when uh, it hits different elements or different molecules, which then absorb that light in a wavelength specific way. So if you look at the spectra that is that is there uh, emitted from, uh, gases that have uh, elements in them, you can see which elements are there. And so for that, for that was the basis for the invention of the spectrometer. And of course, is the basis ultimately for our detection of, of methane isotopes at the ecosystem scale. On the right is somebody that, uh, the guy on the left is something that physicists might know, but probably biologists would not. But hopefully most people here know who Carl Woese here, who um, died just a few years ago. Uh, I guess, well, I guess it's uh, nine years ago now. So. Uh, but it, he uh, is the discoverer of the third domain of life, the archaea, which of course include methanogens, um, and more, and also relevant for here, the the inventor of basically the how to do phylogenetic taxonomy via the 16S ribosomal RNA marker gene. So uh, both both sides of this kind of work are sort of traced to these shoulders of uh, are enabled by standing on the shoulders of, of these giants. So anyway, let me go ahead just to sort of say where we're going with the uh, work at the, at the thawing uh, mire and the interactions between permafrost and um, climate change. So we wanna go beyond single organism correlations, which is what I just showed you, to a more multi-dimensional community understanding of controls on organic matter cycling across the carbon cycle. So here's just depicted basically the strategy for We're basically using whole genomes of different organisms along with their functional capacities. Fiction of what we've sequenced from the Meyer, um, 1,500 complete pods assembled from their meta from the metagenomes, which is representing something like 60% of the microbial genera of the Meyer. Uh, and we'd like to link this to some index of what's going on geochemically. And so on the right, we have the, uh, the, the current stage of, a, of the technologies of organic matter metabolomics um, by a Fourier transform ion cyclone resonance mass spectrometry, which is something that's being done by um, Malak Tafali, which is in our, at the University of Arizona and a collaborator of this project. Uh, using this this great latest technology, uh, again an extension of uh, a kind of spectrometry. So um, 
anyway, the, the, what we'd like to do is link these two. We'd like to connect the functions that are revealed in the ecological context of the community to the metabolite cycling of the organic of the carbon cycle um, through all across all the uh, uh, process, uh, reactions that are happening. So he, here's just a quick picture. That there's a lot of science behind this, but a quick picture of the difference on the left between the partially thawed bog and the fully thawed fen in a, an analysis that marries networks of metagenomics, which is uh, gets us me metabolic capacity, with metatranscriptomics, which gets us sort of an idea of the activity of those different capacities, with metabolomics, which is the reactants and products that are either consumed or produced by those reactions. And so here on the left is a network sort of zooming in on part of um, the methane metabolism network. The, so the, the circles are metabolites. Uh, the size of the circle represents their relative abundance, their abundance. The connections between them are the reactions that are sort of inferred from the keg network of reactions and the uh, lines indicate or, or the lines indicate the, um, the transcript expression. And so the darker the line, the more abundant the transcripts that represent that, ex that expression. And as we see between com by comparing the partially thawed bog to the fully thawed fen, there's a great intensity increase in intensity of reaction rates uh, because the transcripts are, are increasing. And so this is the kind of thing that we are aiming for doing, which is connecting uh, mechanistically at the across the dimensions of, of microbial metabolism, the kinds of things that are going on and being able to discern the mo molecular microbial ecology, metabolism, and connecting that to the, the biogeochemistry and the reactions of of processes and uh, that we're interested in, <clears throat> uh, in this case, methane cycling. Uh, another interesting uh, aspect of this is uh, ability to, to, to look at basically the function, the diversity of this system and how it changes. And so what we see here is a really interesting correlation on the left. The graph on the left shows the correlation between functional diversity represented by the functional genes in the, in the metagenomes and the metabolite diversity represented by the metabolomics. And you can see a sort of correlation emerging there between the greater the increase in functional diversity, the greater the capacity to process different metabolites and therefore the simultaneous increase in metabolite diversity. And this seems to be related to carbon cycling from the graph on the right, which we see that the inverse correlation between the concentration of CO2 uh, in the pore water is inversely related to the metabolite diversity, suggesting that with higher metabolite diversity, there's greater functional capacity to consume and process that, that CO2. So this is uh, exciting new work that's emerging that will hopefully be coming out in the next year or so. Um, but I just wanna at this point sort of take a step back and summarize what I've told you about the system. and. These two figures represent the ends of the spectrum of the kinds of technologies that are enabling us to tackle this genes to ecosystem scaling problem. First, we have sort of an empirical demonstration at the top that we can make gene to ecosystem linkage by connecting methanogen communities detected by you know, technology one to ecosystem scale methane isotopes. Um, but of course, this is just correlative. Uh, the second figure then shows the direction we're going, which is the marriage of metagenomics metatranscriptomics, uh, metametabolomics to combine ecological with metabolic study to look at mechanisms that is rea it's particular reactions that are driving carbon cycling throughout the whole carbon cycle. Okay, so that's, that's uh, challenges one and two illustrated by this example of thawing permafrost. Let me just talk quickly about uh, challenge three, um, which is that, which is testing that, test, testing our concepts and our theories and our models for what's going on. So for that, we need to use a large scale experiment, experimental infrastructure like we have here at Biosphere 2, um, because this actually enables us to do manipulations and precisely control the manipulations and precisely see the environments because they're enclosed environments of, of what's going on, but, it, but at a large enough scale so we can represent, we can capture uh, the things that happen at the ecosystem scale. Uh, and so our sort of crown jewel of Biosphere 2 is the Landscape Evolution Observatory. Um, and the things Leo has that we need in, a tech, in an approach to test our scaling theories are number one, it, it has to have a scale. It has to have different scales. It has to have the small scale, which of course in some sense is easy, but it, ha but it also has the large scale, the ecosystem scale, which means it has to be big. And this is indeed big for an experimental system. Number two, it has to be measurable at those different scales. 
And three, finally, it has to be controllable or manipulable so we can see the effects of precisely created different conditions. So this system is really, uh, here, here's a sort of uh, zoom in look at that. Um, and here's a picture of one of the hill slopes inside Leo and it's got a crushed tephra system, uh, basalt soils that are basically just fresh uh, ground volcanic uh, tephra. So they're um, really are the initial stage of, of soil formation. Uh, the system is incredibly well instrumented. So we see here, uh, there's something like 1200 sensors per slope. We see here four different layers of sensors that are measuring all kinds of things from soil temperature and moisture uh, to gas samples uh, to uh, um, water potential by pressure transducers and, and various uh, CO2, you know, measurements of CO2. So the point is we have an incredible array of, of sensors that are uh, allow us to see at a relatively refined scale what's going on in this system, unlike you could in most real systems. Um, here is another illustration highlighting the above ground sensors. There's a network of those that are on some of these booms that can be lowered, which measure air temperature, wind speed, gas fluxes like CO2 and, and, and water. And you can see here a, a worker uh, for scale, a, a person who's uh, working on a suspended um, uh, boom to, to be able to sample without disturbing the surface. Uh, we have life in this system that's that's starting to happen. Here is uh, even before we have planted anything, uh, spontaneous colonization by these Fumarian mosses, uh, which is a very interesting thing. And, and actually, if we look at this system, we, we have also have a network of, of cameras above these that are looking at uh, thermal infrared as well as just uh, the different spectra of light. Uh, here, here's just a quick picture of, of what we're seeing of that, that hill slope that had that Fenaria moss on it uh, this, uh, just a, a few months ago. Uh, but what we have here on the, on the left is just the false color visible image from a normal camera, RGB camera showing the black are the bare soil areas that is basically the crushed tephra. The green are mosses and the orange are sort of biotic crusts that are colonizing the system. And if you look sort of, at, you know, the, the black areas that are uncolonized, that really absorbs a lot of the incoming energy. And so those get hot, as you can look, see from the middle panel is basically the thermal infrared image of this same hill slope. One of the things you see is basically the thermal shadow of the space frame above this. And so the, of course, where the shadow falls, those areas are cooler and therefore darker in this image, the lighter areas are the places that are hot. And you can see, it looks like, I mean, these aren't uh, geo-referenced exactly. These are just quick, quick impressions, but if you, you, you can, I think get a good impression that the light areas on the middle panel are actually corresponding to the black areas on the left panel. So we can see right here, if that's true, a clear effect of life uh, on the system at the, at the larger scale, affecting the thermal environment and the climate feedbacks to the atmosphere that we would expect just from the, the change in the effect of, of life as it starts to colonize the surface on the, uh, on the climate of this system. The right panel incidentally shows a uh, embedded sensor interpolation of, of the five centimeter soil temperature. Um, so anyway, this is just giving an indication of the kinds of things we're, we're going to do. Uh, we ha have many other instruments, including here's our, the, the, the runoff water is collected by these uh, tipping bucket gauges, which represent uh, measure the amount of water that's coming, but also the geochemistry and the microbial communities, which can be sampled. Um, and so in the end, we're sort of aiming for a model system for geochemical research that is manipulable in terms of rain and temperature. It can address hydrological, geo geochemical, biological interactions at multiple scales. In the end, we have a model, we think, for understanding the hydro-bio-geochemistry of an evolving landscape, observable in three dimensions at, at multiple scales. Um, so that, that's, uh, we're just uh, starting the process of putting life on Leo, and, and that's our next challenge. Uh, and, and in order to meet the challenge of doing that and in doing these kinds of studies, I wanna just finally highlight our overarching challenge number four, which is training a new generation of scientists in ecosystem and genomic sciences. Because this is really hard to do because it requires now bringing people in with completely different expertises um, into a team to really make this all happen. Um, and so we, we were very fortunate to be um, a group of us at the University of Arizona to be able to get a uh, NSF training grant. Um, NRT is uh, NSF Research and Training. Uh, that's the program. We proposed this 
and, and now are successful at having gotten a NRT, which we've called Bridges, which stands for Building Resources for Interdisciplinary Training in Genomic and Ecosystem Sciences. And there are listed our, our team of core PIs, although there's a much larger team of people across seven different units at the U of A that are uh, allowing us to do this. Um, and the, the, the this figure here shows uh, a picture of a bridge, which is bridging between these two sciences, the genomic and the ecosystem sciences, uh, and the different cables and the roadbed there indicate the things that were the program elements that we're using to try to do those things. But if you look at the bulleted list on the left, that's basically our, our, our goal is that we want to train diverse scholars to realize the promise of the convergent ecosystem genomics. And the training is the thing that, that is really needed um, to make ecosystem genomics a really convergent interdisciplinary science because it's the boundaries between these sciences are just in some sense, the legacy of past training practices of these things as separate disciplines. And the training goal is to overcome these boundaries. Uh, and then bullet two sort of emphasizes that by emphasizing the need to understand that these different disciplines are also different cultures of science that uh, we need to uh, understand the differences in these cultures in order for us to overcome the boundaries that uh, divide us um, and achieve uh, the convergence we want. Number three, uh, very, intimately connected with the challenge of, of be doing diverse disciplines is the challenge of having a diverse community. Um, excellence is achieved, we now know by a lot of science that has studied this, by diversity in people. Uh, and if we want to realize diversity in disciplines and do that well, we want to have a diversity in, in people, including ethnicities and demographies. And we sort of see the overcoming the barriers of disciplinary diversity as a common cause with overcoming the analogous barriers to diversity of human trainees and practitioners. And we should, of course, as an ecologist, we, we should see this. Ec ecologists value inherently the, the very idea of diversity is at the core of ecology and that diverse communities facilitate robust functioning of ecosystems. And of course, why shouldn't it be the same in human community as the sciences as well, that diversity uh, conveys robustness and excellence. Uh, so that's what we're aiming for with that. And the idea is that number four, this will, the emerging science of a truly convergent ecosystem genomics will help us solve real world problems that matter from these things about the microbial ecology of greenhouse gases, uh, where we hope that studying this world's smallest organisms can help solve some of the world's biggest problems. So of course, Rod Wing's challenge of building better agrosystems to meet the feeding 10 billion people challenge. So that, that's, that's uh, where we're at. Uh, with what I'm going to say, I think that finishes pretty much. I, of course, want to acknowledge funders, uh, which are diverse in this case, just as our problems are diverse. And again, return to the shoulders of giants upon which this work rests. So thank you so much, folks, for, for listening to this. Thank you, Scott. Um, that was very interesting. And it was really um, enlightening to see the two talks, you know, starting from the genome and now going to all the way to the ecology of it. And it really shows the breadth of expertise we have at hand and how we can solve these real big problems. So today was a great overview type of seminars where we can um, broaden our imagination and you know confront these issues. Um, so I now want to open the floor for questions to both Rod and Scott, uh, please. Um, if you want to put your questions in the chat, feel free to put it, or if you want to unmute yourself and ask the question directly, please go ahead. Everything's clear. <laughs> It takes a minute to zoom out. Does <laughs> either clear or uh, completely obscure? <laughs> one, one or the other. So maybe I can start the discussion by asking one thing I found very interesting, Scott. Now I can understand the context of it that I found in your CV that uh, you had a, a you played a pivotal role in filing a Supreme Court brief and also orchestrating a public policy letter. Uh, against uh, you know of, of some of the comments made by Scott Pruitt 
for global climate change. I know it's a very sensitive topic, but now I can see the perspective you have gained over the years. Maybe you could, um, you know, in a few words, explain the, especially the recent um, public policy letter you coordinated and filed against um, uh, comments made against global climate change. Uh, sure. Uh I think that, I mean, you're pointing to, I think as, as scientists who study um, the Earth system, uh, and in particular in my case, in, including aspects in which biology is important for the climate system and, you know, the concern we all have as scientists who understand how the climate works and how human activities are changing uh, the Earth's climate, that, and that, that this is posing a risk to human societies that, um, that we as scientists naturally have I think a special responsibility or duty to to clarify when there are when the science is is being misrepresented in the public debate about these pressing concerns and and um, so th there I've tried at several points and many of us do try I think to, to try to to bring the, our knowledge about these systems and, and concern about the misunderstanding of them sometimes or misuse of them. Uh, in, in the public debate. So uh, the, the, the first example that you mentioned was this uh, a, a US Supreme Court case in 2007, Massachusetts versus EPA, that was basically the first su Supreme Court case to deal with climate change. And we, uh, I, I helped organize a group of, of climate science experts who, who submitted a brief to the Supreme Court, uh, what, what's called a friend of the court brief or in Latin, amicus curiae. And that just clarified what the science was um, and was actually cited by uh, during oral argument by one of the justices. So we know they read it. <laughs> Sometimes in these ex uh, big profile cases, you get hundreds or thousands even of, of these briefs. But uh, in this case, it was a bit basically clarifying. And um, that case laid, basically that case asked whether under current law in the US, uh, Greek CO2 and, and things could be considered air pollutants and therefore eligible for regulation. And the Supreme Court basically made a decision which facilitated uh, an agreement that that CO2 and other greenhouse gases like methane could in fact be considered pollutants under the meaning of the law and therefore were eligible for, for regulation. So that was the basis for the President Obama's administration's regulations to limit uh, greenhouse gases. Of course, a lot of those regulations were then overturned under the uh, Trump administration more recently, and that brings us to the second point you asked about, which was how, whether Andrew Wheeler, who was President Trump's administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency, who was basically denying the uh, importance or, or the, the science of climate change, and in particular of whether CO2 was causing changes, whether human caused um, emissions of CO2 were causing climate to change. And and so there, there was, we again sort of, that, that was a more general comment that the same group of scientists who had been involved in the Supreme Court brief also, you know, responded to him in a letter just saying that, no, you've got the science wrong. We, we do know quite clearly that human caused activities are in fact changing the climate. Um, and so now, you know, that <laughs> of course my work here is showing how microbial communities are also helping change the climate, but they're being stimulated uh, in terms of this thaw gradient coming into being by uh, the actual exactly. impulse of human activity. Yeah, but that's very inspiring. I think as scientists, we, we do have a role to step into these debates and offer our opinion. Otherwise, you know, that that, that kind of slight and, uh, you know, disrespect for mm -hmm. science is, goes unanswered and it's really in, uh, inspiring. Thank you. Uh, let me check. So there's no question on chat. Is anybody raised the hand? Nobody raised the hand. Oh, for Rod, okay, there's a question in uh, Giovanni Malandri has asked. Uh, for Rod, is the resequencing project of the 10,000 rice accessions aimed at developing free tools for easily searching the SNPs and structural variants? And is the pre indica panel part of these rice accessions? So there are two questions, Rod. Um, uh, my lights just went out. Let me uh, turn them back on. Sorry. All right. Um, I would say the. Uh, you could the, call uh, this lights out presentation. 
Yeah. <laughs> the uh, the question about the prey panel. No, Th these are. Uh, this is not part of the that that panel. This is um, uh, ten thousand uh, accessions. Uh, a new set of accessions that have been uh, um, uh, set up from uh, from from Erie. I mean, we want to do the whole, you know, the whole thing. So it's, um, uh, and they're definitely being um, set up to call SNPs across everything as well as structural variants because we're, we're doing um, uh, 30 to 60 X coverage for, for everything. So, it, and, and the, the, the 3K data is really kind of, it's, it was just a beginning experiment. So, I mean, the, the, the reads are, it's a lot of them are single reads. They're not, they're not, from both ends and ours are going to be paired in reads and a lot, a lot more uh, better coverage and better, you know, again, mapping everything to 16 genomes or more. So I think it will be a, a more powerful data set. And we, again, we, we are already mapping those three, the three K that's already exists to the 16 genomes. So I, I, I had a, I had a question for, um, Oh, also have you tried sequencing? Single nuclei from rice. Yeah, David. Oh, that's from, from David. David. No, I, I haven't, David. I know you want to, so we'll. we'll uh, uh, yeah, ahead. one of the, the thoughts I had was that um, quite a few papers are coming out looking at mammalian systems and seeing um, SNPs that are cell type specific. Mm -hmm. um, SNVs that are cell type specific and so forth. So I just wondered if you'd ever seen anything that might suggest that happened in plants as well? Um, not yet, but uh, okay. that, that, that would be an interesting uh, experiment to do, I think, from different, different tissues or something like that, so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I actually had a question for, uh, for Scott, and uh, this is the, you know, how do we apply what you're doing to agricultural systems? And we've, we've talked a, a fair amount about this. And um, because, you know, uh, again, rice is one of the biggest uh, methane emitters in the world, right? In terms of uh, agriculture. So, um, yes. Um, so, applying your, you know, your concepts to ag agriculture. Yeah. Well, I think we could think about this um, in a, very loose sense, you know, instead of the, you know, thawing mire, think about it as a rice paddy. <laughs> and imagine instead of different thaw stages, you're looking at different extensions of rice or different cultivation practices and trying to understand um, or, or, or discovering the uh, mechanisms that are either facilitating or inhibiting methane production associated with those different practices. And then trying to, therefore, based on that understanding, amplify whatever the things are that are inhibiting the methane production. So you can end up with uh, rice cultivation with much diminished methane production along the way. So that would be a way that I would see a sort of a, a loose but not so far-fetched analogy for what we could do with these can, kind of technologies is to really try to understand um, understand in order to, to control or in this case limit methane production that goes along with uh, growing rice. So we should try to renew, renew that conversation again, I think. Yes, we should. <laughs> we tried a few times uh, with uh, some other colleagues who know this stuff. So, but yes, yeah. let's, let's, let's do that again. We should try to do that again. So. Especially now that we have the uh, NRT, we'll, we'll have a, a good way of funding additional students that can help advance that yeah. goal. Because because we, we're not only, that that's, you know, that the training program, the bridges is, is really, encompasses both sort of fundamental questions and theories of these things, as well as practical applications like agro ecosystems. Uh, so we really, in addition to the interdisciplinary parts, we want to bridge the theory to the practice um, as well. Yeah. Um, I don't see any other questions. I'm while waiting for other questions. So Rod, I wanted to ask you a question, actually two questions. First, I'll ask, um, you know, the, one of the important things you are generating for the world is these proper gold, gold standard, as you call it, the good sequences for, I mean, all kinds of 
varieties, um, species, and everything. Um, because that raised the ground information so that we can, for example, breed some of, bring in some of the traits from these things <laughs> into the cultivated. Have you gone back to, uh, before this knowledge was gained, people have brought in some traits. Um, and is there a way to look back and say that, see, had we known the sequence information, we could have done this faster or so that it, it serves as a platform or a model for future breeding approaches? Well, I, uh, I guess my, my, my example is, uh, you know, I mean, th this is in the dark ages, but uh, uh, a simple example is uh, I, I tried to clone a gene in tomato and we didn't have any of these resources. And it took me 10 years to clone that a single gene. If I would have had the sequence and then, I, you know, it would have been like two years. But now, nowadays, you can pull things up uh, much, even much faster than that. So um, um, Simon Krattinger, who's a professor at Cal Snow, is, is actually doing this now in wheat very quickly. So with disease resistance genes, you know, actually. And that, that's, a, that's a genome that's uh, five to six times larger than the, the human genome. So it's, uh, or, 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 yeah, exactly, five to six times larger than the human gene. So it's, uh, it's uh, incredible how fast you can move now. So, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. And as for any other crop, is there a wealth of, like the way you have done for rice is available? No. Because again, uh, that I think, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's all now starting. I mean, it's so easy to do, do it now, but, right. uh, you know, um, I think, you know, uh, uh, you know, maize has a has a pretty good set. A lot of the, a lot of the crop plants have a good set. I would say it's not really um, uh, the the genus, for example. So, like in rice, you know, we're not only looking at the cultivated species, but we're looking at the entire genus itself. And uh, as a, as a whole system like that, that's a that's a bit rarer than like I mean. So, like I think maize has several, uh, you know. 50 or 60 really good genomes now and, and, and wheat is coming along, things like and soybean. But um, yeah, the technology has really changed uh, very, very rapidly. And it's, it's, it's exciting. Um, and uh, so it, it works, we're really excited about it. it, it it's making a, a, a big difference because then, you know, just you, you have everything at your disposal. So you, you can, find private SNPs in, uh, in, in different populations. And uh, so it, it just, uh, it's, it's nice. And it's, uh, it's, it's uh, very, very rapid, you know, so. Yeah. Okay. So we are approaching, we are three minutes away from the one and a half hour mark. So go ahead, please. Hi, hi. can I just ask a quick question to Scott? Um, thank you for your talk. I'm Vanessa from Kaust. Um, I, I think you went over the Biosphere um, project quite quickly. Um, I'm wondering, uh, it's a, obviously a massive uh, research program, uh, and you mentioned it's for also a teaching tool, but I'm wondering how you are using the Biosphere in your research. Are you building a biome to represent a specific environment, or are you looking at the evolution or of an environment? And how do you build the microbial environment? Yeah. Right, oh, very, very good questions. Uh, and thank you for bringing that up. You're quite right. I, it was the most, uh, the briefest of uh, touchstones on, on a quite a large project. So I, I have a lot of, uh, my, the other area of my research background is in tropical forests, um, which may seem quite distinct from uh, thawing permafrost in the Arctic. Uh, but if you think about the things from the perspective of where the carbon is on the Earth's surface, it does make sense because the two places where there are lots of carbon are in tropical forest trees and in thawing in, in peatlands of, of Arctic systems. Uh, and uh, so one of the things we're doing actually in Biosphere 2 is uh, that I didn't mention at all is a tropical rainforest biome that was specifically intended to mimic that. And so there's quite a bit of work going on in there as well as what I presented um, that's, that's looking at, basically we're using that as an experiment for looking at the effects of drought, which are in, predicted to increase with uh, climate change in the, in the tropical systems, especially uh, in the Amazon rainforest where I 
I do a lot of work. And so we've been, um, Laura Meredith has led those experiments that have really laid a, 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 a great finding for both microbial and plant community responses to, to drought and warming in, in the tropical systems. And so, but, but, but we're, um, so that's happening, that's, that's continuing. Um, and that's a specific sort of biome that is being looked at that is, that is in some sense analogous to real world biomes. The LEO experiment is a little different, the Landscape Evolution Observatory. And, and one of the things I'd like to emphasize is that we're uh, not, th that, that system is, I mean, if, it's, if it has an analogy, a uh, natural analog, it's to, um, to basically, you know, like the ecosystems of Hawaii that were formed by basalt uh, uh, substrate that was created by the volcanic eruptions that created the Hawaiian Islands. So you could imagine that maybe is being an analog for that. But what we're really aiming for with Biosphere 2 is not so much to represent the particulars of a, any real natural ecosystem, but to be an experiment that can look for biological principles and how they connect with principles of physics and chemistry to make ecosystems function in the way that they do. And so our goal is not so much to understand by investigating, for, for example, LEO, how LEO works, but we want to understand uh, how biology and chemistry and physics interconnect to make life happen on landscapes the way that it does. Um, and so the we've been um, doing for, for a number of years, focused on the physical and chemical aspects of LEO. It's been going for about five years now without any uh, direct intervention, planned intervention on the biological side. Of course, microbes are there. <laughs> um, but because this, but there, it's a fairly depauperate or has been until now system just because it, it's, um, basically zero organic matter at the starting point. This is uh, crushed, basically basalt. Uh, and therefore what's happening a lot though is, is weathering, which is a chemical process that uh, actually takes up CO2. So these, these hill slopes, these bare hill slopes are big sinks of CO2, not because of the biology, but because of the, for the chemical weathering. Uh, and so understanding that first stage of it and, and, and how now that biology is coming into it, affects those things. Uh, and biology so far has just, like I said, been opportunistic. There's the microbes that are there, which are basically highly autolithotrophic communities and simple communities. Uh, but as we get organic matter into the system, now through those, first those non-vascular mosses, but the next step is to actually do introductions of, of plants, vascular plants, um, to see how the system evolves as we put, as we like to say, put life on Leo. And, and so the, the, the microbial life is mostly going to be an opportunistic study, except for the fact that because one of the key processes for getting life on landscapes is the coupling carbon and nitrogen nutrient cycles, uh, and this is a highly nutrient limited system, the first plants that make sense, I think, are going to be nitrogen fixers. So we're going to be aiming for using alfalfa plants, which, of course, is... A connection maybe to agricultural systems, but but because they're a nitrogen fixer, they'll be the alfalfa, different strains of alfalfa along with different rhizobium strains. And I was couple... that was going to be my next question: how you get nitrogen into yeah. the system as well? <laughs> it's great. It's really exciting. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so anyway, that's where. Thank we're you. Right. Thank you for that anyway. description. It's really interesting. Thank you, and nice to meet you. Yes. And my, nice to meet uh, everybody. I think on here is a new. Uh, except for Rod and Ravi uh, is a is a new person. For me. So great to meet a new community and connect to people. Thank you. So maybe with that very positive note and a comment, we could uh, bring our today's seminar to close because we have five minutes past the half hour mark. So um, really appreciate Rod and Scott doing a great seminar and um, and all the discussion and for inspiring talks because we have to sometimes step back and think big, only then we can achieve big things. So thank you very much. Is that uh, okay, Rod? I'll turn it over to you. That's good. Thanks, Scott. Good to see you. I'll be in Likewise. Tucson in uh, middle of